おはようございます。あ<笑>っ、すばらしい。スキルレベル、ジャパニーズ。あっ、first like to give honor to God, to our pastors, our church officers, the lay ministry leaders, members of this church, visitors present today, and those joining us online. It's truly an honor and it's a privilege. To share in this worship service with you and those of you joining us today online. The love of my life, Momo and I, began coming to the San Diego Japanese Christian Church.、Uh, I originally said December, but she corrected me, it's November. <laughs> and we've kept coming because of the love of God we encountered here and the immediate sense of community. And the friendships that were forged here.、Uh, Momo and I would also like to thank you、uh, for、uh, your prayers, for my mother, and for our safe travel to Pennsylvania and back. God has truly blessed my mother, and we're told that,、uh, that she would need to be, initially, we're told she'd need to be sedated and intubated.、Uh, that There was no guarantee that she would wake up. And then、uh, there was no guarantee that she would survive extubation.、Uh, when we left to return f o r California, however, the hospital caseworker was、uh, helping my mother decide on the best rehabilitation treatment center to transfer to. God has given my family his peace. About her healing and her recovery. We thank you for your continued prayers for her. And as you've heard, the title of the message today is God's Word Gives Us Hope. And the scripture comes from 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. I'm reminded of a song. It says, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Why do I bring this up? Well, because there are times when the natural progression of life's ills can surround us and lead us to a place of tears and grief. A time when people's well meaning words can amount to accept it and move on. But no matter the circumstance, God's word of promise can give us hope. We get an indication first、uh, looking at the setting here in verse 1. The first three words of verse 1 say, In those days. What days? Well, I'm glad you asked. We're going to look at、uh, the scripture leading up to our text,、uh, specifically in 18 and 19, chapters 18 and 19 of 2 Kings, that cover over a decade of history in those days. We'll learn that more about the rise of an imperialistic superpower bully. Assyria. Think of it this way Assyria is to Israel and Judah as Russia is to Ukraine. Assyria had besieged the northern kingdom of Israel in the fourth year of King Hezekiah's reign in the southern kingdom of Judah. And after a three year campaign, Assyria sacked Israel, deporting its population. And taking its resources. And as we think about the setting of our text, we have to pause to recognize that though some problems occur at no fault of our own, there are troubles that come as a direct result of our failings.、Uh, Northern Kingdom of Israel, for instance, did not obey the Lord their God, they broke the covenant he made with them. They disobeyed the laws given by Moses. And the scriptures tell us that they would not listen and they would not obey. 
says 2 Kings 18, verse 12. Dr. J. Vernon McGee comments, the northern kingdom was defeated. Now there was nothing, not even a barbed wire fence between Assyria and Judah. King Hezekiah was in a bad spot in those days. Within the following 10 years, Assyria applied economic pressure on Judah, demanding its resources, and Hezekiah resisted. We know this from 2 Kings 18, verses 13 through 16, wherein the Assyrian army overtook all of Judah's fortified cities, at which time Hezekiah sends a message to Assyria to say that he's finally ready to pay whatever Assyria demands, which was the equivalent of 22.5 tons of silver and 2.25 tons of gold in those days. A great Assyrian army returned, and this time employing information or psychological warfare against Judah and a show of force to convince Judah to surrender. Assyrian propaganda was particularly crafted to dissuade Judah from trusting in its allies like Egypt, its own Judean armies, its own leadership, and God himself. Hezekiah responded by praying and seeking a word from the Lord. We read, for instance, in 2 Kings 19, verses 15 through 19, and 2 Chronicles 32, verse 21, that Hezekiah presented written threats received before God in prayer. And God prophetically answered via is Isaiah, sending an angel who in one night breaks the Assyrian siege, killing 185,000 key leaders, captains, and decorated warriors. In those days, by the time of our text, 2 Kings chapter 20, God has gotten Hezekiah through tough times. God has kept his word, and Hezekiah's faith has grown. And now Hezekiah is faced with an even greater threat. Let's take a closer look at, and see how a word from the Lord gave him hope and changed his life. Three ideas that helped me glean from Hezekiah's experience. An example were as follows, and I would ask that you repeat after me. The bad implication. The bitter intercession. The bountiful impartation. Now you have the sermon, we can all go home. <laughs> Just kidding. The bad implication. An implication, of course, a conclusion that can be drawn from something, but is not explicitly stated. Look at verse one, the first clause. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. As if national, military, political, and economic turmoil instigated by Assyrian aggression wasn't enough, King Hezekiah now has a major health concern. All that we know from the text in that first clause is that at the rate Hezekiah's condition was declining, people could conclude that he was not going to survive. And then he received the bad news, confirming everyone's suspicion. Independent of God's intervention, his condition was terminal. The rest of that verse says, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Has anyone here ever received bad news? News that marked the end of hopes and dreams? News that suggests it's all over, that we should accept our lot, and move on. Hezekiah has just been given a poor prognosis based on an inflammatory and ulcerated sore condition we get it, 
We get that information or some of that from verse seven, a condition that has progressed to its final stage. He is told that nothing more can be done for him, that he should accept it and begin to think about end of life preparations. End of life considerations appropriate today would include a living will, an advanced directive, do not resuscitate, do not intubate orders, and palliative and hospice care options so that the last moments could be made as comfortable as possible. No matter where we are in the continuum of time, the prospect of death can be overwhelming. And this moment must have been overwhelming for Hezekiah. What kind of man was Hezekiah? What would Hezekiah need that could revive his spirit and sense of hope? Well, we get some idea of this as we turn the pages back again and learn that King Hezekiah was a man of courage, a courageous man of faith, who no matter the circumstance, never lost faith in God. When he came to power, for instance, he exerted moral courage, reversing his father's policies, making reforms that sparked national revival, cleansing the land of idol worship and images erected to idol gods. On par with King David, his trust in the Lord was unmatched by his predecessors and by kings who would follow. He frequently sought a word from the Lord concerning circumstances he faced and obeyed the word of God. And the scriptures tell us that the Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. He subdued the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified cities, says 2 Kings 18 verses 7 through 8. He exerted physical courage, resisting Assyrian and Philistine aggression. He did all this while a more pernicious enemy waged warfare on his health, a battle at the time of our text that he was desperately losing. We will read that only one thing could help revive his spirit and give him hope, a word from the Lord. To what or whom do you turn when trouble hits home? when the circumstances seem hopeless. And now we're at our second point, the bitter intercession. To intercede is the act of asking or requesting to God for oneself or others. Let's look at verses two and three. Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord saying, remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I've walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Hezekiah had confidence in God. And when the chips were down, we do not read that he looked to people who surrounded him to help him self-soothe. We don't read that he self-medicated with any mind-altering substance or drink. He did not turn to anything or to anyone but God in prayer. We can do the same, even if ours is a bitter intercession. We too can have confidence in a God who hears our prayers, sees our tears, perhaps tears that no one knows about, and have confidence in our God who can heal us, revive us, deliver us, defend us, no matter the circumstance. Doesn't his word say, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. Psalm 34, 19. And now we're at our third and final point, the bountiful impartation. 
Importation is the act of granting or communicating of something held in store. God had something in store for Hezekiah, and it was given to him only after he asked for it. Let's look at verses four through six. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him saying, return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day, you should go up to the house of the Lord and I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant, David. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, says Ephesians 3.20. This spoken word of God was exactly what Hezekiah needed and more than what he could ask or think. Hezekiah prayed about his life and God answered by sending him a word, granting him healing, added years of life and addressed national security concerns. And God does not always heal the same way every time. Sometimes God heals by ending people's suffering, ushering them into heaven. Sometimes God heals suddenly and directly. We call those miracles. This is all miraculous. Other times God's healing happens over varying periods of time. And for Hezekiah, God heals him over several days and through the best of modern Middle Eastern medicine uh, at that time. We get that hint from verse seven, which says, then Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. So they took and laid it on the boil and he recovered. That lump of figs was what Isaiah referred to as a poultice of figs in Isaiah 38, verse 21. And that is a soft, moist mass of material, uh, typically a plant material or flower applied to the body to relieve soreness and inflammation and kept in place with a cloth. One commentator suggests the practice of applying figs to an ulcerated sore is well attested in the records of the ancient Middle East. Being mentioned as early as the Ugaritic tablets of the second millennium, BC. Though there are times that problems come as a direct result of our own undoing, some of life's problems come as God allows them in our lives for our good. I'm reminded of the scripture of Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them which are the called according to his purpose. Not only had the Lord healed Hezekiah, adding years to his life, but God also healed Hezekiah spiritually. Isaiah records the words of Hezekiah wrote after his recovery as such. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. Isaiah 38, verse 17. He had been forgiven for all his sins. And notice the timing of the miracle. I'm sure that Hezekiah would have preferred that God heal his condition long before reaching its final stage, before people had given up and suggested that his days were numbered. When God fulfills his promises, he does it according to his timetable, in the fullness of time, at the perfect time. And God watches over his word to perform it. If he said it, it's going to happen. And that's why we as Christians need to study God's words, God's promises, and his written word. 
The same can be said about prophecy. The test of true prophecy is that it will happen. How God does it and when he does it, that's up to him. And this is why I'd like to share my testimony of what God did for me. Early in 2019, I received advance notice. To me, it was a bad implication that I would have to retire the following year due to non-promotion, even though I still had another one last evaluation for promotion before retirement. My wife and I prayed about it, as we have many times have done in the past, sometimes in bitter intercession. But it was at a Bible study, a young woman gave me a word of prophecy, a word from God of bountiful impartation that I was going to be promoted and that people would marvel. That word was an answer to prayer. And when I retired from the Navy in October of 2020, there was no retirement ceremony due to COVID-19 safety measures. Retirement ceremony plans had been canceled twice. Seven days after I was out, after I was completely out of the military and retired, the selection for promotion list was disseminated. And I started receiving congratulatory calls from colleagues. Continued service at the next rank was a matter of prayer for us. So I petitioned the Board for Correction of Naval Records, and seven months later, the Secretary of the Navy's board decided that all records would be corrected to show that I had indeed been promoted and that I'd never retired. It was exactly seven months after I started civilian work as a hospital chaplain. I resigned, I resigned, I sold my home. We moved to California and reporting for duty in seven days. God did exactly what he said he would do. People are still baffled over the fact that I returned to active duty and was promoted after retiring. That the way that I was promoted, the years added onto ministry in the Navy were done in such a way that only God could get the glory. God can reverse what others have said is too late. God can heal and deliver what has been proclaimed dead. When God says live, there's no force that can change that. His word overrules what people say. God restored my neighbor career after it was all over. I think of Vera, my sister, youngest sister, had stage three pancreatic cancer and reoccurring pancreatitis. Vera cried out to God asking that he spare her life. My mother told Vera, God said, you will live and not die. And I read somewhere that the Whipple procedure that she underwent, were in the head of the pancreas, the first part of the small intestine, the gallbladder, and the bowel duct are, are, are removed, has a 25% survival rate. Uh, not only did Vera fully recover, but she did not need radiation treatment or chemotherapy. The word she received gave her hope. When God says live, there is no force that can change that. His word overrules whatever people say. There are times that God chooses to intervene by healing us emotionally, giving us his peace that can get us through the worst of circumstances. And for example, the writer of the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, Horatio Spofford, God gave him his peace despite tragic losses. Horatio Spofford, some of you may know his story, a devout Christian and Presbyterian layman and businessman, 
originally from Troy, New York, and living in Chicago, had a very successful legal practice specializing in international law and worked as a professor of medical jurisprudence at Lynn University and trustee and benefactor at what is now McCormick Theological Seminary. This Sunday school teacher's closest friends were evangelists like the famous Dwight L. Moody, also from Chicago. At no fault of his own, this man's faith would suffer some of the worst types of loss. First, his son died. Shortly thereafter, there was the October 1871 Great Chicago Fire, wherein he lost all of his real estate investments along the Lake Michigan shoreline and his law office all overnight. In November of 1873, he had planned on joining his wife and four daughters on a European vacation trip. But at the last minute, a real estate sale of some of his fire-damaged property delayed him after his family embarked upon their transatlantic journey aboard the luxurious ship, the SS Bill Harbor. On 22 November, the SS Bill Harbor was struck by a Scottish ship, Loch Earn, causing a 12-foot hole in the SS Bill Harbor's hull. Some passengers died upon impact, but within 12 minutes, his four daughters were lost, ages 11, 9, 5, and 2. And on his way to Cardiff, Wells, to join his wife where 86 other survivors landed, he reportedly penned the words of the poem, later to be published as a hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. In closing, not only does God hear our prayers and sees our tears, but his word can bring about healing. Regeneration when people tell us it's all over. Deliver us, protect us as we put our trust in God and in his word. In fact, God's word promises eternal life to anyone who will believe on Jesus Christ, the word made flesh as savior and Lord. Paul writes, but what does it say? The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised them from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word that encourages us to know that your word gives us hope. There may be someone among us who may be looking for hope and hasn't found it. And they've heard the scripture that their hope could be in God, that they can know the love of God for themselves, that all they need, would need to do is confess you as their Lord and Savior, believing in their heart that you raised Christ from the dead, and by that they can be saved. Lord, we pray for that person or those persons now, here or online, that you save them today. Lord, we're lifting up before you any among us who after uh, we're, we're Christians already, but Lord, we may be experiencing some difficulties in life. Lord, we're asking that your word will come alive in our hearts today. May we grab on to the hope that we know is in God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, whose word gives us hope, be with you all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.